everybody. This is lecture four of co-occurring disorders with Dr. Greg. For this lecture, we're going to be covering readings from the Atkins textbook that cover anxiety disorders and OCD. We're also going to be covering mindfulness and acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a form of mindfulness that is in a uh, manualized form of treatment. Uh, that will be from the Big Land et al. 2008 reading for this week as well. So jumping into things, we'll be covering a couple of these anxiety disorders in more detail than the others. Uh, particularly, we'll be talking about specific phobia, social phobia, panic disorder, uh, agoraphobia, and generalized anxiety disorder, which people also shorten as just GAD. We won't be talking too much about separation anxiety disorder or selective mutism because these two um, uh, <clears throat> disorders aren't often linked with substance use disorders as a co-occurring disorder that happens in a very frequent basis. So jumping into just some demographic trends, one important thing to keep in mind is about 30% of individuals seeking treatment for alcohol use disorder also had a co-occurring anxiety disorder of some kind. Uh, well, uh, the slide that I showed you prior are the primary anxiety disorders that are associated with uh, alcohol and other substance use disorders. What's important to keep in mind is that most anxiety disorders tend to develop before the substance use disorder begins to be noticeable or problematic. There is one uh, anxiety disorder that typically or more often develops after a substance use disorder, which is panic disorder. Um, something unique about that one and something important to keep in mind clinically because oftentimes you may see somebody who is gaining sobriety from an alcohol use disorder may suddenly begin to start reporting very troubling symptoms that you may later find out to be uh, panic attacks uh, as part of their early recovery process they may need to learn some additional skills and how to deal with a panic attack moving forward let's talk about specific phobia um, Basically, specific phobia is a marked fear and anxiety about a specific object or situation. And this marked fear and anxiety has to last for at least a six-month duration or longer. <clears throat> there are many different types of things people can become very fearful or anxious about, including a variety of animals, natural environments such as heights, storms, water, other catastrophes, uh, blood, injection, medical care or injury, situational um, environments such as airplanes and elevators and other things like uh, choking clowns, really anything. You know, there is no limitation to what someone can necessarily have, fear or anxiety, to an extent that becomes a phobia. What's important to keep in mind is not only is there this marked fear and anxiety about it, but this anxiety and fear has to almost always be provoked um, every time this person is exposed to this thing. Um, and the person must also actively try to avoid uh, these situations or notably enduring these situations with intense fear and anxiety if they are in those situations. Of most important too, <clears throat> now I did say that almost any type of uh, kind of uh, situation can be a phobia, but what's important is that for it to be a specific phobia, this fear and anxiety has to be out of proportion of what the actual danger of this thing is. That's why you really can't say somebody is phobic of being a military, you know, in an active military zone because there is a great deal of actual fear or danger uh, in those situations. So it's all about also does the fear match the level of danger in these situations? And if the fear is significantly greater than the um, situation actually entails, then that's another sign. One quick note uh, about blood and injection uh, phobias is that they tend to re behave very differently than most other phobias. Most phobias, people will experience an increase in blood pressure and heart rate with a lot more sweating, other signs that typically show that the uh, sympathetic nervous system has been activated. So that's when something becomes escalated, right? Uh, the difference with a blood and injection phobia is uh, the opposite tends to actually happen. Blood pressure drops, it plummets to an extent, and um, the person uh, becomes very faint. Um, so that's very different than what we would normally see from other types of phobias, which suggest there's some sort of physiological, a unique physiological component to somebody who experiences a blood type phobia. Now they still will develop a lot of fear in relationship to this blood type uh, uh, it's, you know, to blood type stimuli, um, just a lot of the other physiological things would be very different. <clears throat> Moving on to social phobia. Social phobia is almost exactly the same as specific phobia, only when it comes to the 
um, specific thing that the person is fearful of. You're more so narrowing this down only to social situations where an individual is exposed to possible scrutiny by others. So what we're seeing here is the individual strongly fears that they will act in a way that will be negatively evaluated by those who are witnessing or viewing them. So that's what makes this a little bit different than in, uh, all the other uh, is a specific phobia, which is this has to do with uh, social situations and uh, the fear of being judged or uh, ridiculed somehow by others. Agoraphobia is also a little bit different as well. Once again, this is an our um, <clears throat> disorder that is very similar to a specific phobia, but the object of fear is once again a little bit different. With this, someone is experiencing marked fear and anxiety of at least two of these five situations here. So these specific situations, public transportation, being in open spaces, being in closed spaces, standing in line or being in a crowd, being outside the home alone. Now, what you'll see is that these situations are pretty broad, right? We almost have every conceivable situation on this list. So here's really the um, critical aspect of agoraphobia. Wherever this person is, and obviously it's not really in the places where you are um, safe, right? The only place really that's not listed on here is being in your home or being in a family member's home where you feel safe, right? The fear is centered around um, the idea that escape from the situation, the place they're in, might be difficult or it might be difficult to get help in the event of a panic attack or some other embarrassing or difficult situation to cope with. So narrowing this down, basically we're saying this is a type of fear where you're out in public somewhere perhaps, or a movie theater perhaps, and you suddenly get this dreadful feeling that you can't get out easily, right? Maybe you're in a movie theater and there's people and you're in the middle of the row, right? It would not be easy to get out. And suddenly you start worrying that you could have a panic attack or something and not be able to get out very easily. That feeling is what agoraphobia is, the fear of not being able to easily get out of the situation or the place that you're in, um, whatever place that may be. So the other uh, uh, criteria are the same as specific phobia. So once again, uh, this fear is almost always provoked um, in these situations. Um, these types of situations tend to be actively avoided, and the fear or anxiety is out of proportion of actually being in these particular situations. So this is kind of when we think about um, when it comes to the impairment, right? When we think about impairment in a certain situation, this is what would constitute something that would be impairing, right? This person is uh, probably avoiding a lot of different situations if they have agoraphobia, right? Public transportation, being out home alone, uh, being in enclosed spaces of any kind. If you are feeling tremendously fearful and avoiding these situations, well, that's going to impair a lot of things you may want to get done in your life. Panic disorder is when one is experiencing uh, recurring and unexpected panic attacks. So repeated episodes of panic attack, um, which is defined as an abrupt surge of intense fear or discomfort that reaches peak within minutes, um, with four of 13 symptoms, which I'm going to list out for you in just a second. Now, another thing that's important to keep in mind is at least one attack uh, has been followed by one month or more by either or both of these two things. One, persistent concern or worry about additional panic attacks or other consequences or significant maladaptive change in someone's behavior. And we would specifically be talking about avoidance of the possible triggers that one may attribute to why the panic attack happened. So keep this in mind, panic disorder, when we're talking about the disorder itself, is not just about having recurring panic attacks. You can have recurring panic attacks and not have panic disorder. What has to also happen is you're also experiencing at least one month of persistent concern or worry about having more panic attacks or avoiding things that you think may be causing the panic attacks, right? So there's a really important thing to think about clinically with that, right? It's okay to have panic attacks. The real problem, the real thing that's the disorder is when having panic attacks is causing you distress. Uh, that's really cl uh, clinically important because a lot of helping someone through a panic attack is helping them realize it's just the panic attack and they're more common than we think. So here's all the symptoms of a panic attack. Like it said before, four of 13 symptoms are necessary. And here's the 13 symptoms that one could have. Palpitations, sweating, trembling and shaking, sensations of shortness or breath of breath or smothering feeling 
Feelings of choking, chest pain or discomfort, nausea or abdominal distress, feeling dizzy, unsteady, lightheaded, faint, chills or heat sensations, paresthesia, which is feeling of numbness or tingling in the fingers or toes or face. Um, I will talk more about derealization and depersonalization later on, but very briefly, derealization is when you have this strange sensation that the world around you isn't real and you want to feel detached from the realness of the world. Depersonalization is when you feel disconnected from your body, almost like you're outside of your own body. Now you still have reality testing, but you just don't feel connected. That's kind of the same thing with these two. Derealization and depersonalization are kind of like a detachment from yourself. There's also fear of losing control or going crazy and fear of dying. These are all the symptoms, right? You need at least four of these, along with just the fear that you will be experiencing with this combination of symptoms, right? You could have these types of things. You can be afraid of death, right? But when they happen in combination like this with an intense amount of fear, right? Like they see, say here, a surge of intense fear or discomfort that happens very rapidly within minutes, that's a panic attack. And many of these symptoms can all happen at the same time. Additionally, there's a few other culture-specific symptoms that people may report down here, including tinnitus, which is the ear ringing, uh, neck soreness, headaches, or uncontrollable screaming or crying. Now, these can be symptoms in addition to the core symptoms of a panic attack, but you do have to have at least four of these ones before they include these culture-specific ones, too, just because there isn't a whole lot of very solid research yet on these culture-specific uh, symptoms. Uh, another thing that's really important to keep in mind is a panic attack. Now, we said before that having panic attacks isn't itself a disorder, right? Panic disorder also comes with two things. Remember what they are? One, oh, <laughs> well, now I'm panicking a little bit. I'm trying to remember. One is having that severe, intense worry about having future panic attacks. The other symptom is uh, the avoidance factor. Hey, see, I did it. Let me, let's go back and make sure I got that right, right? Persistent concern to worry about having additional panic attacks and significant maladaptive change. So a little bit broader than what I said. Typically, avoidance is, you know, avoidance of triggers is what you'll see most often. So remember, those two things have to happen with uh, the panic attacks as well. Now, you can include a panic attack specifier to somebody's diagnosis. Specifically, if you have a diagnosis of a different anxiety disorder, or depression, or a substance use disorder, or PTSD, you can also include with panic attacks. That's what the specifier would basically say. So you would say, I diagnosed this person with PTSD with panic attacks as a specifier. Um, so it's really important to make sure to distinguish between panic disorder and having panic attacks as a specifier, right? Because it's, it's important. You know, a lot of times people may experience panic attacks with these other um, disorders as well. So that gives you a little bit more flexibility to add that in. All right, now moving on to generalized anxiety disorder, which is excessive anxiety or worry occurring more days than not for at least six months. About a number of things, a variety of things. In fact, this could be a very wide variety of things this person may be um, anxious about, and they may report all of these in one session with you. And they may often shift from one concern to another. So it may look like a lot of shifting between different thoughts, which could almost look like another um, disorder that we recently talked about, which could be hypomania, right? With hy hypomania, there's a lot of distractibility, flight of ideas. It may look a lot like that. The difference is the thoughts that they are verbalizing will all have the, t the similar topic of worry. You know? And there's a difference between worry and fear. Keep in mind, fear is of something very specific, something that you can identify as an actual threat somehow, right? Like, I can be afraid of a gun pointed at me. I don't have anxiety about a gun being pointed at me. I'm having anxiety about what the person holding a gun might do. Anxiety is about what you don't know. Anxiety is simply, or worry that is, worry is simply about something that you don't know the outcome or the answer to yet. So keep that in mind too, that worry isn't necessarily about these specific things that many people um, 
uh, may not actually feel any sort of reaction to at all. Anxiety or worry is, is just nonspecific very often and hard for someone to define. And in this particular situation with this disorder, it's going to be about a lot of things too. Someone's going to report to you that, and it's important, one of the criteria here is that it feels very difficult to control the worry. That's a very important part of having generalized anxiety disorder. Also, will be accompanied with at least three of these six symptoms. Restlessness, restlessness or feeling keyed up or on edge, being easily fatigued, so having very low energy very often, more times of the day of the week than not, difficulty concentrating, or your mind is going blank a lot, having a lot of irritability, muscle tension, and other sleep disturbances such as initiating or maintaining sleep, or just having very restless sleep. We well, can see, and it was very interesting about generalized anxiety disorder, although we use this one very often, Sometimes these symptoms can be very easily overlooked or not properly attributed to generalized anxiety disorder. For instance, sleep disorder, uh, sleep disturbances could easily just look like insomnia. Difficulty concentrating could easily look like ADHD. So it's very important that we look at this full picture, right? We see that the anxiety and worry is about a variety of different things. That's how we know it's not a phobia, right? Phobias are going to be very specific fears about something in, specific, in particular. Be it social situations, uh, you know, uh, natural catastrophes, whatever it may be. Um, when it comes to the GAD, it has to be very broad. The person has to report difficulties controlling the worry, and we have to see at least three of these symptoms in combination with each other. All right, so I'm going to stop the first section of this lecture here before I move on to obsessive compulsive disorders.